Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want us to turn to Genesis. We come back to Ezekiel in a minute because I want to read from Ezekiel the environment of God. But I want us to just check a couple of things here about the atmosphere. The first thing God gave man is found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and that was right this way down he gave man an image. What did he give man? An image. What did he give man? An image. God gave you an image. Let us make man in our own image. The word image doesn't mean to look like. It means to have the same nature of. So God created you with his own nature. The word nature is where we get our word natural from, natural, and therefore Whatever God is naturally, he made you to be naturally. And God is naturally love, but he's also naturally a ruler. That's why he is called Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Shishkenu. Jehovah means almighty. He is in charge. And he gave us that same nature of rulership. Now, please look, if you will, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, a living soul, a complete whole. And that word actually means a composite. You know, man is made up of three unique dimensions. A body, which is his house. A spirit, which is the man. And a soul, which is his mind and will and emotions, which connect the two. When God breathed into man oh, the breath of life, man became a complete whole. A trinity in one. But verse 8 is more important this morning. I want to focus on verse 8. Verse 8 it says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, east in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. The Lord God planted a garden. I want you to put in your notes, God himself created Eden. Man did not plant the garden. Man had nothing to do with the garden. The Bible says God himself planted the garden. Now what's very important here, I want to reinforce this, are the words that come next. And the Lord God put the man in the garden. This is very important that man did not wander into the garden. God didn't allow the man to discover the garden. God didn't leave it up to the man to find it. No, God didn't trust that. God created it and then he put the man in it. Which tells us something about the garden. And that is, man needs the garden. Now I think you would agree with me that obviously he can't be talking about trees. Uh, the word planted here is a Hebrew word which means to establish. Can you write that down please? Because our concept of planting has to do with digging a hole and putting some stuff in it. No, this word planted has to do with establishing. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you could say that Bahamas Faith Ministries planted this building here. Am I right? That's proper to say that. Now, it doesn't mean that we dug a hole and then put a building in it and then it grew out. But planted means we built it. We established this place here. Well, that's the word that is used by God here in this scripture. He says he planted, he established 
the garden of Eden. God didn't plant trees. He established a place. And he called it Eden. Well, it's important here. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, down the page. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and said, work it. Everybody say work. So God planted the garden, put the man in it, and then he repeated it in verse 15. He took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to what? To work. To work. The original purpose and plan of God was to extend and establish his kingdom, heavenly kingdom on earth, obviously, through his family of sons. And when man was created to rule, to dominate the earth, of course, God made him king as well as he was. He gave man the rulership, a mandate over the earth. But then God did something strange. He placed the man, the earthly ruler, in the garden he himself planted and God called it Eden now, I think we all in this church who have been coming here for a while know what the word Eden means but I'd like for you to write it again because uh, the Lord instructed me to teach on this this morning everybody say Eden I had so many confirmations this morning I am so thrilled if you don't listen to me this morning I believe you might be missing a clear word from God I heard so many confirmations this morning about atmosphere something's wrong with our atmosphere the environment the way we treat the I'm really going to be speaking on in a moment the courts of the king. And that's why the king doesn't like to be around many of us because we don't have the right environment for him. The word Eden, the Hebrew word, I'm going back to the original word, it's a word that has five strokes in the Hebrew. Hebrew language is written in strokes. If you ever see a Hebrew word, you see these little strokes. Well, the, the word for Eden has five strokes, and each stroke in the Hebrew language means something. Even the little dots and the little tittles. You know, a tittle is a little, like a little comma, and a dot is like a dot. And then you get these strokes. Hebrew is written that way. So when you read it, the Hebrew language, uh, the, every word, we call it a word, is actually a sentence. The word Eden is actually the word Aden, A-D-E-N. Uh, we, we spell it Eden in English, and it actually has a lot of meanings. First of all, one of the strokes means spot. S-P-O-T. Another stroke means hmm, moment. Moment. And then the third stroke means presence. Presence. And the fourth stroke means open door open door and then the fifth stroke means delightful place delightful place uh, those of you who use your Greek concordance and you look up words if you look for the word Eden you'll find all these words listed and sometimes you would find in some of the, 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 the older dictionaries words like delightful place of pleasure it's a delight to be in this spot. Well, the word Eden then literally means, if you were to, that's why it's difficult to translate these words into English. Because how would you like to, to read the Bible like this? And the Lord God took the man and placed him in a spot for the moment where the presence of God was an open door to heaven. I mean, that's kind of a confusing sentence for you. So, what they did was just put the word in, Eden. But Eden is not just a word. Eden is actually a spot on the earth where God's presence touched the earth in other words God established he pulled it down and he established a spot on the earth where his presence was a continual open door to the heavenly atmosphere 
and there he put the man. In other words, God created the man to dwell in the same atmosphere he dwells in. So the word Eden literally means the presence of God for the moment touching earth on a spot. That is where God created you to exist. Now, listen carefully. What is this place called? It is called Eden because it is the presence of God right from the heavenly realm. God literally pulled a piece of heaven down and established it on earth and told the man to live in that particular place. Now, those of you who have studied archaeology or read about it, you know that they have a lot of things they found that are in the history of the Bible. They found, you know, the Mesopotamia area. They, that's where Iraq is today. Iraq is actually right in Mesopotamia, which is where they believe that the Garden of Eden was in that area which is the northern part of Africa originally. The map of Africa actually goes all the way up and covers where you see Iran, Iraq is. That used to be a part of Africa. Now follow me. That was the spot in the area where they know, therefore, this place called Eden was. The problem is no archaeologists have ever found Eden because you can't find an atmosphere. You can find Bethlehem. We know where that is. You can find Jordan. You can find uh, uh, Nazareth. We, we've been there. We've visited those places. But no one has ever found this place that is all through the Bible. Because you cannot find a place that is not tangible. Eden is an atmosphere. Write it down. It's an environment. Eden is therefore not a physical place, but it's in an atmosphere. In other words, and this is very interesting, very important. If God had to take the atmosphere that you need out of heaven and put it on earth, then that means that the atmosphere you need to live in is not on earth. Say la. I'm going to say it again. Just got to get this. God made this creature and the creature came out of God. Which means whatever God needs to live in, the creature will need to live in too. But the place where God wants to put the creature doesn't have the atmosphere. So God has to bring the atmosphere out of where he is and put it on the spot where he wants the creature to be and then he puts the creature in it. Now, your body does not need the presence of God. Your body needs the presence of the earth's atmosphere. <laughs> so you get oxygen. That's not from heaven. That's on the earth. Uh, you've got, you know, uh, uh, food in the soil from the animals and the plants. You can eat this stuff. That's on the earth. But you, praise God. You ain't no dirt. <laughs> you are not dirt. You are spirit. And the same thing that God needs. You need. And so God created fish to live in water. God created plants to live in soil. And God created stars, verse 14 of chapter 1, to live in the firmament. And God created animals, chapter 1, verse 24, to live in the ground, on the earth. But when God made you, he created you to live in whatever he lives in because you didn't come from the soil or the water or the firmament. You came out of God. You got the same nature as God. And so if 
God needs this presence for him to enjoy his own life, then you also need the same presence. And that is why you could physically be in a palace like Queen Elizabeth and still be depressed. Selah. You could have your Lexus and your big house on the ridge and still be depressed. Why? Because you see, you are more than just dirt. And that's all that is, is dirt. A house without the presence of God is nothing but bricks. And that's why the answer that Jesus gave to Satan was a very simple answer when Satan said to him, feed yourself. Jesus said, uh, uh, you know, man doesn't just live by dirt alone, you know, uh, but he lives by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Why? He explained what the words are. He says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they give you what? life water gives fish life soil gives plant life my presence gives you life you should clap now I want you to write this down Queens and Kings do not visit palaces they live in them <laughs> That's important. When the man told me this is their house, I said, wow. So when they walk into the room, it's like coming into your, your, your dining room, and they don't have any big shock about this table that's two miles long. <laughs> All these golden chairs and, and the chandeliers, you know, eight or nine of them big massive chandeliers over the table. T to them, this is home. You are not supposed to visit the presence of God. You don't come to God every weekend to get a fix. I hope I'm talking to all of us, you know. We, 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 we sometimes say, well, I'm going to church. What do you mean you're going to? God is so serious about you living in his presence. He said, your body is the temple, not this building. Uh, it's Acts chapter 17 verse 24 through 26 it says God does not live in buildings made by man's hands but he lives in the bodies that his hands made from the soil God already built his temple and you're sitting next to one of them because he wants the presence to go with the temple uh, you, you get it after I'm gone. Now, a kingdom has to have a king. And God took this king, Adam. And keep in mind that Adam is a description. It means dark earth. But man is the name God gave to the being inside that dark earth. And so Adam is Adam man. <laughs> Adam is placed in this spot called Eden which is the environment of God and then God said to him work uh, it seemed to me if I can submit this to you that you really cannot work properly until you are in the presence of God so whatever you're doing outside the presence of God is always below God's expectation always A kingdom, therefore, is what God gave Adam. King means ruler and dominion means to dominate. So a king domination means kingdom in effect. In essence, a kingdom is the governing influence and impact of a king on a territory over which he executes his will, his values, and his purpose. A kingdom is the manifested 
authority of a king in a domain. I want to repeat this please. A kingdom is the manifested authority of a king in a domain. I'll repeat it one more time. Very important to write this down. A kingdom is the manifested authority of a king in a domain. When Great Britain ruled this country called the Bahamas or Jamaica or Trinidad, they manifested their authority here from England. You knew that they ran this place because of the way the place looked. They manifested their authority here. We drive on the left side of the road. We drink tea, hopefully. Still, we have the English attitude toward dress. We wear ties and coats that came from England. That's not African. Matter of fact, you could tell which countries were dominated in Africa by the British. They wear suits in 99 degree weather. <laughs> you get that some other time. We're the only people who really don't wear cool clothes in hot climate. Because we were, <laughs> we were controlled by an empire that manifested the suits. And what's amazing to me is I go to England, they wear push jackets. <laughs> they left the suit a long time ago. But we so mm, anointedly converted. They manifested their authority here. One of the greatest manifestations of their authority as a kingdom here is that we speak English ninety percent of the population of this country obviously came from some African descent and we don't speak Cantacunte why we were under a new kingdom that converted us and now we look and act and speak and eat and drive and sometimes tries to mimic it you know, our kingdom leadership that's what God wanted on earth he wanted heaven to sound on earth he wanted heaven to dress on earth he wanted heaven to drive on earth so that you don't have to visit England to see England just come to the Bahamas he that have been to the Bahamas have been to England. That's the way the Romans did it. Wherever the Romans went, isn't it amazing to call themselves Romans? They were from where? Rome. And when you are in Rome, you do as the Romans do. In other words, every place that they conquered became just like Rome. So it is with God's will. That's why when Jesus told the people how to pray, he said, pray like this. Thy kingdom, your manifested rulership, come. Thy will, what you want it to look like, come on earth, just like it is in heaven. He wants earth to look and act just like heaven. He wants to extend his kingdom. Every kingdom must have the following things. Write this down. It must have a king. Number two, it must have territory. Number three, it must have a constitution. Four, it must have citizens. Five, it must have laws. And six, I'm going too fast. And six, it must have rights and privileges. And seven, it must have an army. And eight, it must have a commonwealth. I'm going to repeat them for those of you who are writing. A kingdom must have these components. Number one, it must have a king. Every kingdom must have a king. Two, it must have a territory. Got to have a place that it dominates. Three, it must have a constitution. A body of law. That's why number four, it must have laws that citizens obey. Five, it must have citizens. People who are subjected to the king. Citizens. Six, it must have rights and privileges. And that means every citizen under a king has certain rights that the king guarantees them. And by the way, those rights uh, are privileges. Number seven, 
Number seven, every kingdom must have an army. All kingdoms have an army. And in the kingdom of God, the army is not the citizens, the army is the angels. There's a couple of words in the Bible that are very poorly translated in the King James Version, and even some of the other versions. And uh, of course, it confused me too years ago, but this may help you when you read the Bible. Uh, whenever you see the word clouds or hosts, that's referring to the army. It's referring to the angels. When the Bible says you will see Christ coming on the clouds of glory, that doesn't mean he's coming on this white stuff. This white stuff, you can't stand on this stuff. It's talking about the angels coming with him. Well, think about it. When the queen shows up, who's with her? The gods. <laughs> the Bible never called you soldiers of Christ. He don't need you to soldier him. Whenever he needs help, you know who shows up? The army. When he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, remember that? When he finished the last temptation, it says, the army came. And they did what? They comforted him. Whatever that means, that means they bore whatever he needed and they took care of him. When you see the word host, very important word, H-O-S-T-S. -S. Host is the word for armies. That's the old English word. Host of angels. Host. When the Bible talks about Christ being born, you know who showed up? A massive group of military angels. And they began to what? Sing. Could you imagine? Why? Their king showed up on earth. So they began to sing. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. They began to sing. Our king has come to earth. So we came to make sure he's okay. Uh, well, uh, soldiers protect the king and the kingdom. That's why he said he has given his angels charge concerning you because you are a ruler in this territory. Your angels, the Bible says, even the little children, their angels are always with them. Could you imagine that your little girl in the nursery right now, who is just four years old, got some big angels walking behind her everywhere she goes. Just follow her. Why? Because the boss, the government, told them to watch out for that little tiny queen. You should say amen. That little king. He said, now he ain't quite know what he's doing yet, so we got to make sure we protect him from anyone that want to take advantage of him, including the devil. It's because of the kingdom responsibility. The last one I gave you is that the, the kingdom must have a commonwealth. And a commonwealth is important. A common wealth. That means in a kingdom, everybody has the same access to the same wealth. Now, of course, <laughs> uh, that doesn't work too well on earth, in the earthly kingdom, eh? <laughs> I mean, in some kingdoms, they took the wealth from the territory. But ideally, a kingdom has a commonwealth, which means that the king is responsible for making sure everybody is wealthy. Now, there's a reason for this. The reason why a king is responsible for making sure the wealth is common is because a king's reputation is determined by the status of his citizens. Selah. Let me repeat that again. A king's reputation is, ex is determined by the status of his citizens. So if the citizens are poor, then the other kings talk about that king as being poor. In other words, a king is as wealthy as the people he rules look. Is that making sense to you? That is why God is concerned about your personal need. Now let me show you the difference between a kingdom and a, common, and a republic or a democracy. In the Bahamas or in, in America or in Canada, wherever there's democracy, wherever we get all these, these different types of republican governments, uh, republics rather, you will notice that the, the head of the country is not personally responsible for your light bills. Have you noticed? I mean, the prime minister doesn't call you to check, see if your water bill is paid. Because that's not his personal interest. <laughs> But a kingdom is different. You see, <laughs> it's so amazing. If the, the citizens in, the, in our country are not 
doing well, what do we do? We vote the leader out. We get rid of the person because, you know, <laughs> we want to do well. Because it means that the person who we have as an authority leading us, he's not personally responsible for our welfare. He may provide opportunity, but he's not responsible for what you do with them. But a kingdom is different. A king's reputation depends on the condition of his subjects. Some of you are wondering maybe why the colonies were given up by some of the imperial powers. It's because it was bad for their reputation to keep those colonies. Anybody listening to what I'm saying? Sometimes you think they gave him independence. They didn't give you no independence. They was glad to get rid of you. You was making them look bad because they couldn't provide for you. Because a king must have his reputation based on the standard of his kingdom citizens. That's why David as a king he had to be responsible for the people. That's why when the kings prayed in the Bible, whether it was Saul, whether it was, it was David, or whether it was Solomon, when they prayed, their prayer was, give me wisdom to rule this people so that they can prosper. Why? Because the other kings in the neighborhood are watching us. Even God, when he spoke to the children of Israel, you know, uh, as soon as God claimed that group of people, something happened to God. Did you know that? When God says, I, I, I called you, you are mine, ah, then they start telling everybody else that their God is Jehovah. He is their king. So, okay, no problem. Now God has a pressure on him. God, who is king of Israel, has to make sure they look good. So God says, even though you are stiff-necked and murmuring and you got bad ways, I will still bless you. I will still prosper you. Why? For my name's sake. My reputation is on the line. Now, that's why the, the Bible uses this term, if you are called by the name of the Lord. What that means is, if you go around telling people he is your king, then it says he must bless you. Blessed is the man who is called by the name of the Lord. If you go tell everybody this week that God, Jehovah, is your God, you're going to attract blessing because you put his name in trouble. And that is why when you praise the Lord, you attract him. Because when you praise him, people hear your song. Oh boy. The Bible says the wicked shall hear the song of the Lord, and then it says he shall bless his people and they shall rejoice. Lift your right hand and say, Lord, I told everybody, you are my God. So you better protect your name this week. Give him a little praise, make him feel a little responsible this morning. He has to bless you. That's how I pray when I pray. I say, God, now you know, <laughs> this is bad news if this gets out. Anybody got any bad news? Quiet bad news? You know, my house getting real close to being repossessed. Now, Lord, you know, I've been telling everybody at work that you are my God. This ain't going to look good for you. See, you don't pray that way. You beg too much. Put the pressure on. Listen, did Moses pray that way? Yes, he did. When God was about to kill them people, Moses said, let me talk to you for a minute. And read Moses' prayer. He says, and the Moses prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, you took them out of Egypt. You told the people they're your people. You told them that this is, your, this is what you want to do. And if you kill them, the others will laugh at you, Moses said. God said, Moses, you got me. <laughs> Come on, praise the Lord. That's the king's personal responsibility. That's why he has to make everybody's wealth common. God has no favorites. And that's why you got to know your privileges and your rights. You have a right to have your needs met. Because he's your king. I say he's your king. I say he's your king. Now, what I want to drive home today is this point. Every king 
has courts. And you've read this, and most of you don't know much about a court because we don't have royalty in our country, uh, as traditionally speaking. Uh, we do have a governor that is a representative of royalty in our country because we are still in the Commonwealth of uh, Great Britain, uh, even though we don't get much wealth that is not common. You know, they don't give us... The independence means you cut yourself off from the Commonwealth. Hope you all know that. And that's what Adam did when he sinned. He declared independence from God's government. When you declare independence from God's government, you got to pay your own bills. You got to take care of your own self. And that's why we got to have our deficit climbing every single month. Why? Because Commonwealth means that, you know, they ain't giving us nothing no more. Even though we carry the name, we don't attract no money from England. We declare independence. When you walk away from God, God says, you got to take care of yourself. No wonder why Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, my words abide, you can ask anything you want. Why? You are dependent on the commonwealth of God. But when you walk away and so say you don't need God, God's no problem. You, you are an independent state into yourself, take care of yourself. It's very important to understand the king concept. Turn to Psalm 65. We can come to Ezekiel. I haven't forgotten Ezekiel. Psalm 65. Now I want you to read your Bible real fast here because we got some verses I want you to underline. We're going to talk about the benefits of being in the king's courts. And that is what Eden is all about. Eden is the environment. Let's explain about the courts. And this is very important because kingdom demands a king's court. Verse 4. Psalm 65, blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house. Take your pen, underline it, and can anyone tell me anything unique you see there? Shout it out loud. Come on, we on TV, let them see how smart you are in the Bahamas. What's the first thing you see in that sentence? What's the first concept? Huh? Say it loud. I can't hear you, man. Speak up. That's a soft voice. Come on, preacher. You choose. That's important. In other words, remember I told you, you don't just walk into a king's presence. You got to be invited in. You see how unique that is? It didn't say blessed are those who come in. Let me tell you, friends, Many people walk in here halfway through the worship. They don't understand what's going on. We start at 9.30. You should not be coming here after 9.30. Why? That's an appointment that God has set for us to meet with Him. Let me tell you something. When I went to see the governor right here locally, and I was late, the governor said, my, my appointment canceled. Did not see me. And I had guests. That ain't funny. That's protocol. You don't go and see your royalty and come late. Why? It's a privilege to see them. Do you know that you got a right to see the prime minister but not the governor? Let me say it again because some of you don't understand protocol. You have a right to see the prime minister because you voted for him. But you ain't vote for no governor. It's a privilege when they invite you to the governor's mansion. And when they say 8 o'clock... 8.05, they already gone on to the next assignment. Protocol. I'm afraid to come to worship late. Afraid. Why? I understand kingdom concepts. He who chooses for you to come. Let me tell you, friends, it's a privilege to be here at 9.30 and worship the King of glory, the master of the universe, the God who made all things, including the cells in your body. You don't want to disrespect him at, at, at 9.35. But we do it. May it stop today in Jesus' name. And that means every pastor here too. You cannot, we gotta, we, we gotta clean up the atmosphere in the courts. When you come into the presence of a king, it's not a right. He who 
chooses you to come into his presence you know I also found something very interesting uh, when you go to see a royalty and this happens to me a number of times some of you remember me you were with me you all with me in Namibia and Swaziland eh? now you all remember that eh? these two here the Edwards were with me in Swaziland wasn't that an experience when we went we went to see the king of Swaziland this was real royalty friends now let me tell you something everything we did we had to be told to do they said stand here we had to stand right there I mean, this is Dr. Miles Monroe, big anointed man of God. This little woman says, stand there. Why? The king getting ready to come in and the queen mother coming in too. And you stand right there. Then they say, now you don't sit till we tell you to sit. And then it says, you don't sit anywhere else until we tell you to sit there. Now we come into this place. We got some people here anointed of God by the king of kings to seat you. And you come into the presence of God and they tell you, sit here. I don't want to sit there. See, you don't understand royalty. This ain't no joke. Ain't no joke. When the queen and the king walks into that room where we were, they wanted everything in order. Sometimes they'll say to you, do not look the queen in her eyes. I said, what are you talking about? I can look anywhere I want to look. No, 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 no. In royalty, they even tell you how to use your eyes. When you talk to her, put your head down, they say. And the Bible says, bow before me in reverence. You digging your nose and scratching yourself. See, and this ain't funny. That's why the presence of God don't stay in meetings. We come late, don't sit where we told to sit, and then we don't reverence the Lord. And then we go saying the Lord was in there. We need to learn courtroom etiquette. It's a kingdom. Do you know, they told us, some, sometimes I would say to you, you know, uh, don't move. Oh, you don't listen to me. You don't understand kingdom. Remember, they said, look, once you sit and the queen and king comes in, you, you have to pee in your pants. Is that raw enough? We don't understand royalty. Why? You don't move until they permit you. That's the word they use to move. You want to go in the bathroom? You got to pray. You got to pray for the Lord to speak to the king. Tell the king, Lord, I want to go in the bathroom. Because etiquette means the authority of the king is complete when they enter that room. Complete. You are under authority. When he chooses you to come into his presence, guess what? It's a blessing and it's a challenge. It's easier to live outside the courts of the king than to live inside the courts of the king. Because once you get in there, you have no choice. Coming into this place is supposed to be that way every time we meet here. I'm going to see the king. I'm going in the presence of the king. And you know what he said? Wherever any two of you are gathered together and it's in what my name there I am in the midst that means order is in that place so when we come together at 9 30 we meet at 9 30 that means we agree to come together with the king at 9 30 that means everyone gets up on time to make sure we don't insult the king sometimes praise and worship is so difficult because the king is so disappointed 10 o'clock, the doors packed with people standing behind there, standing in the King said, you know something, I really can't come in here. They don't respect me. I agreed to meet with you all at 9.30. You come in here at 10 o'clock. What kind of insult is this for the royalty? And if you insult him who you can see, he who chooses you to come into his presence, into the courts and he wants to bring you near to live in his courts look at that word what's the next thing you see there he don't want you to visit his courts but to do what live in it in other words he wants you to live in the room I visited 
Could you imagine the Queen of England telling me, now you could just stay right here? Boy, that's something, eh? Woo! I get to sit here. I mean, we eat of these plates all the time? Yes. Do we walk on marble? Yes. All the time? Yes. I don't want you to have spurts of blessings. But the only way to maintain that kind of lifestyle is you got to stay in the courts. What's the courts? Ah. Let's find out. Look at Psalm 84. Turn the page. Oh, by the way, that verse ends, we are filled with the good things of your house. You see that there? Yes, Psalm 65 verse 4. We are filled with what? The good things of your house. When you are in the presence of the king, all that is in the king's house is available to you. Now remember that David is writing this. David is a king. He understands kingship. So David is saying, once you can get in the courts of the king, everything the king has is available to you. The issue is getting into the courts of the king. Think about it. How many of you remember Esther? Remember the story of Esther? Esther's biggest purpose and pursuit was to get in the king's of the courts of the king. She says, if I can just get before the king, everything's cool. <laughs> I mean, she dressed and she, she, she fixed up everything. And her, her deal was just, if I can just get in his presence, I could save a nation. Why? Because once I get in his presence, if he speaks to me, it becomes law. And it did. Getting into the courts of the king. Verse 2, Psalm 84. My soul yearns, even faints, for what? The courts of the Lord. Look at Psalm 84, verse 10. Better is one day in where? Your courts. Than a thousand in Bain Town. Or East Ridge. Or Life at Key. In other words, David says, look, I've discovered something. One day in your presence is more beneficial than a thousand days in my own house. Which was a castle. Now look at how he stands. He says, my heart yearns for the court. David says, I, I am straining to get in the presence of God. The atmosphere. Oh, the kingdom is so awesome. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Hey, boy, say doorkeeper. Say it again. One more time. We got some doorkeepers around here. They work hard. And sometimes you disobey the doorkeeper. And David says it's more important to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to be anywhere else. When these ushers give you instructions, remember you are obeying anointed people with kingdom authority. And when you disobey one of them, you disobey the king. <laughs> They, uh, they told us, you remember Brother Edwards, they told us when we were going to see the king, uh, the queen, mother especially, they said, do not extend your hand to royalty. I said, what are you talking about? In my country, we shake people's hand and greet them. They said, look, this is your country. This is a kingdom. It is called the kingdom of Swaziland. They said, you do not extend your hand to the king or the queen. Now, you see, we walk in. Praise the Lord! God said, now wait a minute. You know, you know, you, first of all, you late. You extending your hand and you, you haven't followed protocol first. Then they said to us, they said, the only way you would shake the king's hand, the queen's hand, is if they extend their hand first. You ever wonder why Jesus didn't wait for you to call him to die for you? While you were yet a sinner, he extended his hand. That's why you can come to the throne of grace. Not because you deserve or you have a right to come in there. He extended his hand. He died on the cross before you even knew it. When a king or queen extends their hand, do you realize what you just got? You've got 
access. Praise God. Do you understand? Once they extend that hand, you, that's why they always talk about the right hand of God. If he ever gives you his right hand, he extends his right hand to you. You have gotten power. The courts of the king is the most powerful place to be. Getting into God's presence. And for us to experience it, we've got to make sure that the chandeliers are right. We've got to make sure the gold leaf is on the wall every time we come together. We've got to make sure that everybody is sitting where they're supposed to sit. And where they're supposed to sit is not necessarily a place, but an order. Kings love order. Turn to Psalm 100, please, very quickly. Psalm 100, verse 4. I'm reading from Psalms because David is a king. And Jesus Christ, standing before Pilate, Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus says, you have said it. Yes, I am. But my kingdom is not of this world. I'm, just, I'm a king just like Caesar's a king. So David is speaking the same language of the kingdom of God. And he says in verse 4, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. And enter his courts with what? Praise. And be thankful unto him and do what? Bless his name. He says, when you come into the courts of the king, don't come complaining. Why do kings like you to be joyful around them? Why do kings like you to be always praising and, and singing songs and, and, and being joyful? Because the atmosphere of the king is important to the king. Oh, look at verse 8. Psalm 100, verse 8. It says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his what? holiness ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name bring an offering and come into his courts you come into his courts by bringing an offering you do not come before a king empty-handed oh God forbid we should never enter this place uh, trying to decide what to give after we get here it happens all the time we don't understand the order of kingdom. Paul says, let every man give as he what? Purposes in his heart. In other words, you beforehand, you, the attitude, what I'm trying to deal with before we get to keys is we got to deal with these basic keys of etiquette. We are not supposed to leave home without already saying, I'm going to see the king at 930. Let me get a gift to give the king. There should never be 25 minutes for an offering if you came to a king. You know, I keep wondering why. Do you know that I found out last week, I was talking to a, a rabbi in the United States. He said, ready for this? He said, 80% of the wealth in America is in the hands of Jews. Now, I want you to understand this now. It's a hundred trillion dollars in America. 80% is in the hands of... No wonder why we don't like them, huh? Now, he said that the reason why they are so blessed is not because they are special. He said, but they obey the laws in this constitution. Even if they don't believe all of it, they obey it. He says, and one of the things they do is they always take out money to give to charity. He said, now those who attend the synagogue, listen to this, this blew my mind. He says, they do not take up collection. He said, you Protestants and you people, you all, you, all, you, you all don't understand the word of God. He said, look, we understand that when you come before the king, great God, they call him Adonai, yeah, Yeshua, yes. They say, when you come before him, he says, at the doors, which we do have some here, and we grew up this way in the Bahamas. He said, the doors, they say, all their gifts are given before they enter the meeting. Oh, y'all don't get it. 
This blew my mind. He says, no synagogue takes up offering. He says, there's a box at the door of every synagogue and the people just know you don't come before Adonai without a gift. Changed my life again. Because the very concept is you don't come before a king without bringing a gift. Where did Jesus sit when he went to the synagogue? He sat by the door, by the treasury box, the Bible says. And he was watching how they gave. Because it wasn't the service that was important to him. It's what attitude they had toward that box that was more important. Because if you think I'm a king, that tells me by what you give. Come on, talk to me. If you are going to see Queen Elizabeth, I mean, she comes to the Bahamas and she actually sends out invitations and you're one of those who got the invitation. And now they give you protocol instructions, which they always do. They would say, now look, you come to the king, the queen, let's, and they'll tell you how to dress and what to do and when to bow and what not to do. Then they'd say, now you got to bring a gift. Now, so you got to come on Thursday morning this week. I want you to think, what would you do if you're going to see the queen? You got to take her a gift. What would you do? First of all, what kind of gift would you want to bring her? I imagine that you would do some thinking. Come on, talk to me. I mean, you would really think, and you wouldn't bring anything cheap. I mean, matter of fact, I think I would borrow some money. Come on, let's talk about this. Because I wouldn't want her to think that I think that she is so low that she receives something plastic from me. You would bring your best. Why? Because your value on her determines the gift you bring to her. Oh, help me, Lord. How you think about a person controls the quality of what you give them. So Jesus sat at the box. Remember now, he's the king. And they, not, they don't know that he's the one who they're coming to, you know, because they, they didn't know who he was. He is actually Jehovah in the flesh. But... He sits at the door to check the gift because he knows that when you come to a king, you got to bring a gift. And he watches. And here comes these guys with $50,000. They take out $25,000, put it in the box. They put the other twenty-five dollars in their pocket. Another one came with $100,000. He put $30,000 in the box and keeps seventy. dollars And Jesus Christ is saying, he says, now they are giving out of their much and abundance. Here comes a woman from Calabash Bay. She's a widow, that's number one. Widow means that she ain't got no one to take care of her. So she's living on welfare. And she stops to the box. And the Bible says Jesus was watching her. And she goes into a bosom. That's where you keep your money, huh? Come on, ladies. And she pulls out a handkerchief. And she unties it over the box. And she shakes it. And guess who's watching? The king. And she shakes it until the two coins hit the bottom. Cling, cling. And she has nothing left. And the Bible says she gave all she had to live on. Boy, she must think a lot about the king. It's not how much you give that matters. It's how much you have left. Some of you got money in the bank. You got a credit card that's up to date. And you gave 20 bucks this morning. And God says, you know something, you really don't treat me like a king. And the Bible says, he called his disciples and said, come, you see that woman there? She has given more than all the others. Because it's not equal gifts, it's equal sacrifice. And she sacrificed more than all of those others. She didn't give out of her abundance. She gave everything she had. Now when the king is pleased. <laughs> nothing is more wonderful than pleasing a king. Because when you please a king, he does things that doesn't seem too normal. When you please a king, he begins to give away his kingdom. The heart of a king is in the pleasure you bring him. The heart 
of a king is in the pleasure you bring him. You want his heart? Bring him pleasure. Herod was a king, wasn't he? And Herod said to that young girl, if you dance before me and you bring pleasure to me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Here's a teenage girl. But a king was talking. He said, if you please me, I'll give you half of my kingdom. Anything you want, just please me. Listen, her mother, oh, her mother was a smart woman. Her mother heard the words of a king. Her mother says, ah, now's my time to get rid of John the Baptist. Because once he promises to give if he's pleased, I can ask whatever I will. I think you've read the Bible maybe, maybe enough to, to, to dread these words. These words I dread in the Bible. Do not stir up the anger of the Lord. Hello? You ever read that? Do not stir the anger of a king. All to the book of Solomon. Solomon said, do not make a king angry. Why? When a king is angry, he doesn't give. He takes. <laughs> he strips you. You don't want to make the Lord angry. That's why David says, oh Lord, turn your anger from me. I beg you, don't be angry. Please, Lord, take away your wrath. Why? The wrath of a king is the worst thing you could experience. And the pleasure of a king is the best thing you can experience. That's why the Bible says, <laughs> in the presence of the Lord, there is what? Fullness of joy, what the last part says, and there are pleasures. How long? Forevermore. Once you get in that presence of that king, you get everything. Final scripture for today. We pick up here next week. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 take a deep breath what you're about to read is very awesome Isaiah is speaking about coming into the presence of the king the presence of God and in Isaiah chapter 1 right at the beginning of the book God begins to speak to Isaiah he says, you tell the people this for me. Verse 12. And by the way, you could read the whole chapter to get a, to, to get a context. And please get this tape this morning. Listen to this tape, please. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit confirmed this word so many times this morning. Disrespect for his courts is a big problem in the churches of Jesus Christ. And it is here. Disrespect. Look at verse 7. Let's talk about the Bahamas. Your country is desolate. Your cities burn with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you. Can we stop reading now? Can we stop reading now? Is that the Bahamas? Yes. Now, God's going to tell us why. Look at this. The, it, it is laid right before you. Foreigners are stripping your land and overthrown by strangers. That's the aliens coming in. He said, first of all, foreigners buying up your property and taking over your country, and then the aliens coming in. Now he's going to tell them why this is happening, okay? Let's read why it is happening. Well, let's, first of all, let's talk about the church. Look at verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have no more than in... I have more than enough of your burnt offering. In other words, God, you keep coming here every week, singing, 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 you come late. You don't sit where you're supposed to sit. You yawn. When people stand up, you sit down. So, so the, the way you treat my presence is incredible. Anybody listening? The Lord spoke this to me. He said, I want you to teach on my courts. Because my courts are keeping the blessing back from people. God is your savior. Listen to me carefully. 
And he's your father, but he ain't your buddy. Clap. We treat God as if he's one of the boys. God says, listen, I'm sick of your sacrifices. I had enough of your bread offerings. And you can use your imagination to describe what they are. That's your singing, your clapping, your dancing, all the music, all the stuff, all the stuff you go through. He said, you know, this, this doesn't mean nothing to me. All your rams and the fat of the fatted animals, I have no what? Pleasure. Now what do you want to do to a king? Please him. In the blood of bulls and lambs and goats, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Trampling of my courts. He's speaking in kingly language. He says, when you come before me, I ask you to come before me, but the way you come, you are coming trampling my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is distasteful to me. Your new moons and sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your assemblies, your evil assemblies anymore. Your new moons, your festivals, appointed feasts. My soul hates all this stuff you're doing. Why? You're trampling my courts. You don't respect the atmosphere. May God have mercy on us. The most important presence in this place is not you. And it's not me. I heard God spoke through a prophecy this morning. He said, this thing is about me. Did you all hear him speak? Now, some of you all didn't because you was late. See, you missed God's voice. Could you imagine? Coming late, you missed God's voice. And to me, that's serious. To you, it ain't much. But I go late because they, they, they can worship long anyhow. See, you're supposed to be in the worship, not wait till it's over. It's about him. We didn't come here to look at your clothes. And if you spend extra time fixing your clothes and that made you late, God says, I hate your worship. All this stuff you're doing, your festival. You can, I dress festively. I got to dress festively because I'm going to church. God said, look, if your festive dressing makes you trample my cord, come in pants and a t-shirt and come on time because my presence will come. If you were here... Uh, uh, please listen, uh, you know, when you're speaking to a crowd, I done figured that out a long time. Some of y'all can take this wrong anyhow. I married nobody. The Holy Ghost spoke to me, told me to speak this, and he confirmed it all morning. Remember Pastor Henry got up, Henry started saying, close the door, stop moving. Why? He said, because you're messing with the present. And some folks come late, don't even care. That was God's, he didn't know what I was going to speak on. God saying, look, if you want my presence, treat me like a king. You trample my courts. He says, stop bringing your meaningless offerings. Verse 13. Verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Look at verse 14. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing your burdens. Imagine God talking to you, man. Because you know something, I'm tired of all this. Lord, I need this. Lord, you, see, you don't need nothing because you don't treat me like no king. I'm not Santa Claus, I'm a king. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. You hear the voice of God talking to you? When you spread your hands in prayer, I will hide my face from you. And even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. God, why? Well, go back to verse 12. Because when you come before me, you trample my courts. You disrespect my prayer. Young people, let me tell you something. Young people in here, you know, sometimes you're worshiping, you're sitting down. Out of order, man. Out of order. Your youth don't excommunicate you from singing and worshiping. It's in, it, it, it's in bad taste for us to not be in unity in worshiping God. We begin at 9.30. Not 
And the Bible says when you come, come with a hymn and a prayer and a spiritual song already. Don't come to get pumped up. Come pumped up already. Singing and worshiping from 7 o'clock this morning. Why? I'm going to see the king. I'm going. Come in the car. I'm going to see the king. And when you come, put your offering right in the box right there. No, no, even no offering. I want you to blow God's mind next week. Just put your offering in the box. Because if we understand the kingdom, we understand how he's supposed to treat the king's courts. Last part of this verse is awesome. Watch this. He says, I will hide my eyes from your prayers. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. What's he talking about? He said, man, you are murderers. My God, you mean me? Yes, Miles, you're a murderer. You kill people on the way to this place. How do you kill people if you wish they were dead? Thou shalt not commit murder. He says, no, I say unto you, if you hate a man, you've committed murder. How do you come to this place? With anger, with strife, he says. And you expect me to hear. May God give us grace to respect the courts of the Lord. But God never leaves us without instructions, eh? The next verse is instructions. He says, So wash your, and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight, and stop coming late. Sorry, stop doing wrong. Stop telling the usher where you want to sit. If you want a seat, you come early and get the seat. And when you come early, they can tell you where to sit. The seat is where the usher puts you, not where you like to sit. It has to do with order, not your favorite spot. Obedience is the number one thing to God. And I heard it this morning in the prophecy. He said, I want you to obey me. Did you listen to the prophecy? When people prophesy, listen man, that's God talking to me. I don't forget it because that's God. The gifts are in the body. Don't ignore the prophecy. He said, it's about me. It's about obedience. What else he tells us? He says what? Learn to do right. Say it with me. Learn. Write that down. Underline it. He said what? In other words, we got to have retraining, man. We need etiquette training. You don't just automatically do this. You got to learn how to do this, God says. Every pastor in here is supposed to be here at 9 o'clock, no later. And if we got to learn that, then we got to learn that, God says. And we all supposed to be here before 9.30. You got to learn that. That's something you got to... God says, look, I want you to learn to do right. It's an education process. What do we want? We want His presence. And we don't want it to come and go. I was so happy the Lord spoke to Pastor Henry this morning. So we don't want the presence to come and then it breaks up by the announcement and then you got to try to get it back and put the pressure on the preacher. It's the spirit of worship. Attitude. Thank God for his word. I say thank God for his word. He says, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Come, let's talk, he says. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'm not mad. I'll make them white as snow. I know you've been messing up, but I'll forgive you this morning. Thank God he's a good God. Doesn't condemn us, but he ain't going to excuse us. He's a faithful God. Verse 19, say it out loud. If you are willing and obedient, I rest my case. Are you willing to obey God? I said, are you willing to obey God? Are you willing to obey God? Then read the last, next statement out loud. Then you will eat the best from the land. Stand up on your feet. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. 
It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.